Okay, so welcome back. Um, in the break, um, there was uh, there were some uh, very interesting questions. So I wanted to also uh, um, answer that on the video. So a question was uh, about the dedicated zeta function of the Hassel of AL function. What in which direction you're getting information? Are you building the L function or the zeta function and getting information about primes, or is it going from getting information about primes to capture information about other uh, arithmetic uh, information about the number field or the elliptic curve. And for the most part, I think um, from all, I, all I've seen, uh, it always goes in this direction that uh, we're building these set of functions to get information, arithmetic information of the, uh, the a finer arithmetic information on our um, number fields and elliptic curves. So for example, in the, in the on the left hand side, it's relatively easy to find uh, the norms of the primes. You can take a prime. So if you want to know what prime ideals are there above seven, then it's not difficult to factor uh, seven times OK. So the ideal generated by seven, you can factor it and find all the primes above seven. And you can start building primes above two, primes above three, primes above five, and build. Um, Sort of a mock Dedekind zeta function to, with enough primes, so you get an approximation of the Dedekind zeta function, and then you can start computing values of the Dedekind zeta function, or at least approximate values, which would give you approximate values of um, of the limit below. Now, one big issue, though, that I didn't talk about before, is that the Dedekind zeta function, um, when you compute the limit, uh, there is if you actually computed and, and got a good approximation of this number, the problem is that it gives you these two numbers as a product. And those are entangled, and it's uh, typically very hard to disentangle them. So this number, the regulator, is hard to compute uh, just straight from the number field, because in general, it is difficult to compute a basis of the, uh, of the unit group. If you had the basis of the unit group, then you can easily compute the regulator. So the problem is computing a basis of the unit group. And uh, also, uh, the class group is also difficult to compute. So the class number formula gives you at least a way to compute the product of the two. And then if you have a way to get your hands on one or the other, then you can compute both. That is exactly what uh, Dirichlet uh, did in 1839. That's why he was doing it for quadratic fields, because for quadratic fields, for real quadratic fields, there are sort of, uh, quote unquote, elementary number theory ways of getting your hands on what is the, um, the fundamental unit uh, on the, uh, in the ring of, uh, in the unit group. And that would give you RK, and then, uh, ta-da, then you would get an answer of what the class number is. And that's what he did. Um, there's a, a formula for the class number of a quadratic field, uh, which comes from this formula. Uh, similarly, in the world of elliptic curves, uh, this part is easy. So um, finding the APs is, this is computational for larger primes. And because you need, typically, you need many primes to do a good job of approximating the L function. Uh, this is not difficult to uh, compute. It's just a computation modulo p, finding all the points mod p on the elliptic curve, and then you get your Fourier coefficients. Uh, the bad primes, that's very easy to compute those Euler factors. So you have a pretty easy way to compute the Hasevea function. And then what you want, um, most of the time, what we are actually interested in is the rank. So you just need to build an L function to uh, enough accuracy that will give you the order of vanishing. So really what we are after is the order of vanishing of um, L at S equals one, uh, which is what we call the analytic rank of the elliptic curve and which conjecturally equals the algebraic rank. So yeah, so we start from uh, information about prime ideals or prime numbers and reduction modulo prime numbers. And from there, get information about very fine invariants that are very hard to compute otherwise. Okay, so thank you for that question. Um, and then what I'm going to do now is move on 
of the, I think I have about um, uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so. And we're gonna start that quick introduction to algebraic geometry. Uh, the references that I'm following, well, I'm following Silverman, but um, if you probably have a copy of Dummett and Foot nearby, uh, chapter 15 and uh, Dummett and Foot is also a pretty uh, nice quick introduction to algebraic geometry, uh, which I recommend also. Okay, so let's get started um, with algebraic geometry. So here, uh, K is going to be a perfect field. So a perfect field is just um, a field such that every uh, algebraic extension is separable. Hopefully you've had an algebra course that's talked about field theory, about separable, inseparable extensions, but uh, you don't lose much in this class if you forget about perfect fields and just think that k is q or um, um, a field of characteristic zero or uh, a finite field. Okay, so if you want to fix ideas and just think that k is q, uh, that's fine. k bar is going to be uh, the algebraic closure of K, um, which is um, a separable closure. But anyway, the, the algebraic closure of K uh, in here, because we're talking about perfect fields, it will be separable. And, um, and then GK is going to be uh, the absolute Galois group, the absolute, Galois group of K, which is um, um, which is thought to be the most interesting uh, object in number theory, which is what we're after. The, all the information that you want to know in uh, in algebraic number theory is all in there, uh, hiding somehow. Okay, this is by the way, this is just a group of uh, field automorphisms of K bar that fix K. Okay, all right. So uh, we're gonna do algebraic geometry. So we're going to start with uh, affine spaces. So what is an affine space? So it's, this is just N dimensional space. Um, so affine space, I'm going to denote it A N uh, over K bar. Those are just uh, points in uh, n-dimensional space with coordinates in k bar. Okay, and um, if uh, you, you can change the field, this is over algebraic over the algebraic closure. But uh, if you want to talk about uh, just points defined over k, then just use k. Okay, so those will be the same, but the X I's are just in K. Then we have a projective space that we're going to denote PN, which is affine space plus points at infinity. So how we define projective space is N plus one affine space, N plus one dimensional affine space modulo uh, an equivalence relation such that a vector uh, or a point X is related uh, to uh, Y, is equivalent to Y, if and only if X is a product or a, a scalar product, scalar multiple of Y for some lambda in K star. Okay, so what that means, uh, for example, um, what is P1? So P1, I think about it this way. Um, I have 
uh, this is A2. So remember, so we go into uh, an affine space of a dimension higher than the P1. And then I have lines through the origin. So because uh, this point and that point are related if they're in the same line. So, whoops. Um, let me try it again. So, so this point and that point or that vector and this vector are a scalar multiple of each other, so are, they are in the same line. So what this is actually identifying is that the objects in P1 are lines through the origin in A2, okay? So those are the points on P1 are lines through the origin in A2. And if you want to identify them somehow, um, so with something that looks more like a line, uh, let's do, for example, you can draw a circle in here, and then you see that each line will pass through this circle twice. So this point and this point in the circle are identified. This point and that point in the circle are identified. That point and that point are identified. So um, if you want, what you can do is now pick one point that represents each line only once in the circle, and then we can take this one and we can take all these points in here, but this one is represented by the initial one, so not that one. Um, so it's a line where this point and uh, this point are identified, so it's somehow um, a circle if you, if you want, but the, the, these two are identified with each other. Um, another way of looking, of thinking of the uh, projective line, again, if you take all the lines through the origin, is all these, uh, you can do another model of the projective line is take a line, say, uh, through, um, through this point, take that line, and then now each line will cross these other line once, so these are, uh, we're going to identify each line with a point that crosses that line, except that there's one more line that is not uh, touching, it's not crossing the green line, which is this line. So uh, the projective uh, line is the green line plus one more point that you see, if I take more and more lines that are flatter and flatter, then what happens is that they are approximating to this line. So these points approximate one point at infinity, which is represented by this line. And uh, if you go on the other side, it turns out that the lines will also become uh, flat to that side. So it turns out that this also goes to a point at infinity, which is represented by the same line though. So this point and that point are identified. And again, you sort of get the idea that these, um, this line is going like this, but sort of like uh, the, there's a common point at infinity uh, for the projective line. All right, um, you can do a similar picture if you want to picture um, the projective space, uh, let's say the projective plane. Uh, you can do the same kind of uh, thinking that now I have uh, the projective um, plane is lines through the origin in 3D. So I can draw a few more. And then to get a model of this projective plane, what you can do is uh, take a plane, um, for example, the plane Z equals one, and then there will be uh, all these lines cross the plane at some point, except the lines that are uh, in the x, y plane. So in the x, y plane, we have to, uh, oops, uh, we're gonna need uh, more representatives, which is like this. And again, now the lines that are in the x, y plane form a P1 in the x, y plane, so now, this point and this point are identified. So basically we have that there is 
a whole plane here, A2, and uh, there, there is also a P1 uh, down there. So what it, the way I imagine then P2 is that I have a plane, a normal plane, A2, and there are directions at infinity. Uh, so there is now a whole line at infinity, uh, which is this P1 at infinity, uh, which gives you the it's just information about direction. So if I have a line, I know it goes at infinity, it goes in that direction, uh, and this line at infinity ends up in this point uh, at infinity. All right, so that's uh, projective space. Hopefully you've seen some projective space at some point in your lives. All right, so now um, note uh, the Galois group, the absolute Galois group, acts on AN coordinate wise so um, for uh, sigma in GK uh, what we do is that sigma acting on a point these are all elements uh, K x1 through xn are in k bar so just act on each one individually and that is well defined. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll say that GK acts on AN like that. And uh, now we're going to start defining um, algebraic sets. So here is a definition of algebraic set. Uh, so let K bar x that's going to be k bar of variables x1 through xn so uh, a big x is going to represent all the variables at once let me write that a little bit better okay uh, that is a big uh, um, polynomial ring and then we're going to let i be an ideal in my polynomial ring An ideal. Uh, then uh, we define uh, VI to be uh, those points in AN in affine space such that F of P is zero for all uh, F in the ideal I. Okay. And this is called the algebraic set associated to i uh, i should probably write that out but anyway this is the algebraic set associated to i okay so um if you are you, you might be very worried here in that uh that condition might be extremely hard to check if you have for example if i had infinitely many generators this condition uh, could be extremely difficult to check, but of course there is a theorem that comes to the rescue here. Thank goodness for uh, Hilbert's basis theorem tells you that I in here is always uh, finitely generated. So finding points that are in VI, uh, it actually, if, you, if it's finitely generated, there's only finitely many polynomials that generate the ideal, and you only have to check that um, that each one of those generators vanishes at P. So it's a finite check. Okay. So um, so this is this is oops, uh, very important um, that that we have that. Okay, so uh, let me let me start uh, maybe here. Just do a tiny example here on the side. Um, for example, I can take the ideal generated by x inside q bar of uh, a two-variable function field, and then I can find what is the uh, the set, the algebraic set attached to this 
those would be uh, the points in two-dimensional affine space. So if this is, say, x, uh, x1, x2, um, such that, uh, let's call it AB, point AB, um, such that uh, x evaluated at this so that a equals zero. Okay, so um, what is that? That is just the points where the x coordinate is zero is the y axis. All right, um, if I start uh, from uh, an algebraic set, I can recover the ideal. So um, I can also go the other direction uh, if V uh, is an algebraic set, uh, then uh, we define the ideal of the algebraic set, the ideal of V is going to be uh, those polynomials in the function field such that F of P is zero for all the points in the algebraic set, okay? So for example, uh, if I have my algebraic set, some, some, something very, very silly, uh, just the point zero, zero, then um, the ideal will be all those polynomials that vanish at zero, zero. So it turns out those are going to be um, polynomials generated by uh, the ideal is going to be generated by x and y. x and y, x is certainly in there, y is there, so x, y is in the ideal, and that is, uh, that is a maximal ideal, so this is the ideal itself, okay? All right. Uh, uh, just a quick question. Yep. So given a set, is there a way to tell if it's algebraic? You might be going over this, but... Um, uh, so if, if, if you take a set, um, then what you do is um, compute the ideal. And then, um, so you, you would try to compute the ideal and see if there is such an ideal. And if so, then that would be an algebraic set. So uh, there's no way to like, um, what I'm saying is how do we know that there always, that there exists an ideal? Um, there, 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 there might not be an ideal if it is not an algebraic set. Yeah, if you have something like, uh, the points on uh, e to the x, on y equals e to the x, right? So if you have, for example, um, v is uh, the points um, x, e to the x um, for uh, x in the, in the reals, for example, uh, then that is not going to be an algebraic set because there is no ideal that satisfies that. So uh, you can try to find if there are polynomials that are vanishing exactly there and then prove that that is not an algebraic set because there is no uh, no polynomial. But this is um, now we're talking about transcendence. So you would have to prove things like um, some some sort of like um, that, that this is not an algebraic set by some transcendence argument. Good question. All right, so um, so we have ideals and um, uh, we have the algebraic sets and we have um, the ideal attached to an algebraic set. And I think I'm almost out of time, um, except that maybe I'll just say one more thing, uh, which is that um, if I have uh, an algebraic set, is uh, said to be defined over k if um, if its ideal can be uh, generated by polynomials 
in kx. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the, the difference here is that we started in the definitions, we started with ideals that are in k bar x, uh, and then that will give you an ideal or that it will give you an algebraic set, but uh, these ideals could be uh, generated at first by things that are not in kx, but if there is some way to uh, define the same ideal with polynomials in k, then uh, that will give you the, the, uh, that, the, that the algebraic set is, itself is defined over k. So for example, I don't know, something also silly is that uh, I could have taken my, um, my ideal to be a square root of two times x, um, but of course, uh, this over q bar, this ideal is the same that the ideal uh, generated by x, okay? The, and then the vi is in both cases, the y-axis is um, defined over q, okay? So this, um, this is actually of an ideal um, defined, oh, Define. I, you have to be careful that, of course, in the function field there are no no ideals, so you have to work over polynomial rings. Okay, but that ideal is defined over Q, and um, therefore we say that the um, that the variety that the algebraic set the y-axis is defined over Q. All right, um, and I'll stop here, and next time we'll just continue with this introduction to algebraic geometry. Um, with um, more things about algebraic sets and about uh, projectivization and uh, the function, the coordinate ring, the function field of a variety, uh, the dimension, uh, singularities, non singularities, and uh, morphisms and all that good stuff. All right. See you next time.